السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام علی رسول کریم العاقبۃ للمتقین اما بعد اسپیکٹڈ برادرس اینڈ سسٹرس ان اسلام Today I was asked to speak on a topic which is of the utmost concern in the society that we're living in today. And that topic is on whether we have to be religious in order to be good in society. You see, my dear respected brothers and sisters, today we're living in a, in a very challenging time. We're living in a time where there is an attack on the concept of religion worldwide. We can see that when we go to public places, for example, we're going to school, or we're going to college, or we're going to university, or we're going to work. Normally, a person that is religious is considered a social outcast. A person that one doesn't really want to associate so much with, because religion, as is being taught is the source of all problems in this world because of religion we have wars because of religion we have strife because of religion we have conflict bottom line eliminate religion and you'll be you'll be able to eliminate every single problem we have on this planet so the solution is that we go about becoming an atheist, for example. Or we become an agnostic, that yes, we believe there is some type of a power out there, who he is, what he is, we just don't know. But this thing called religion, it's really corrupt, don't go anywhere near it. And this is an ideology which is really catching on with the youth today. I mean, coming into this country, Some of us were born and brought up here. Some of us came early in, our, in the early stages of our lives. Some have come just a few years ago. Depending exactly on where we're situated. I mean, if we're here in the east end of Toronto, Alhamdulillah, you have a relatively good environment. But we go more towards the west, where we are from. You can see that... Um, To be privileged with a gathering of this nature is really not that common. And what you have is when people are now going into the public sphere, they're in two minds. Am I supposed to cling to my traditional ways and forsake the ways of every single person that's in this place that I'm in, whether it's a school or whether it's the workplace? Or do I try and fuse the two and come up with this unique identity? Or do I just let go of tradition and fully embrace the ways that everyone has adopted and is adhering to? So there is this challenge. Unfortunately, most of the time what happens is because we have this inferiority complex, we decide to go with the third option, which is forsake tradition, forsake religion, let go of the primitive ways and adopt the ways of the 21st century. This is the only way forward. Now, by doing this, we want to ask ourselves, have we really solved any problems? Or are the problems still the way they are? Or have we created more problems for ourselves? Because really, we don't want to focus so much on society, let's focus on ourselves. Because society is really a body of individuals such as you and I. So we want to look deep down into ourselves and see that by eliminating for us Islam, that is, this is our tradition, and these are the ways that we adhere to. By eliminating Islam, has my life really become any better? Have all my problems vanished within the flick of a finger? Am I totally content and am I at peace in my heart? Something we, we, we really want to pose to ourselves in a genuine fashion. This is some food for thought that I would like to 
leave with everyone that by eliminating these teachings have I truly now adopted peace in my heart? Have I truly now developed satisfaction? Have I truly now developed a set of ways that will take, a, take me away from antidepressants? I don't even have to see Prozac anymore. Or am I now getting closer and closer and being, becoming more immersed in what I would call anxiety, depression? I try and solve one problem, another ten have arised. I try and go and solve the other ten, now a hundred have come. And there's just no end to it. Genuine questions we want to ask ourselves. Coming to the topic, which is trying to be good in society without religion. We want to first and foremost understand that when it comes to the concept of good, this is a very relative concept. It's not an absolute concept. It is extremely relative. Because what is good according to one person may not be good to, according to another person. For example, I may be, I'm speaking English right now. To some people, that's a good thing. To other, thing, to other people, that's a bad thing. Why are you adopting these ways? Why are you speaking English for? When it comes to, let's be a bit more practical, so we understand the concept of good. If I was to go to school, and I have a whole bunch of classmates, say for example, I have 20 people in my class. Now, these 20 people, I want to be good to them. So what do I do? I tell them, listen guys, don't do your homework, give it all to me. And inshallah in the morning, I'm the one that's going to submit your assignment. I'm the one that's going to get your paper done. I'm the one that's going to get all that work done. Now in the eyes of the student, is he a good person or a bad person? You tell me. I can't hear you. That person's a good person, right? Think about it. One individual is coming over to us and is volunteering to do our assignments, is volunteering to do our papers, is volunteering to do whatever it takes to get good grades. In my eyes, that's a good person. But what happens is that very person, he fails to do his own assignments. He fails to do his own papers. In the eyes of the teacher, is he a good person? Yes or no? So we can understand... Well, I think there's a difference of opinion here. <laughs> okay. There was consensus until now. Okay. So the overwhelming majority, they feel that this person is not a good person according to the teacher. So when it comes to this concept of good, we can completely understand and we can see that what is deemed good according to some is not deemed good according to others and hence when I want to be good in society who do I want to be good according to this is the first question I want to ask myself I could be a thug and I'll go and rub, rob someone of all their money take their car keys take all their credit cards away and you know the cash that I just got that was in his wallet I went and donated that to charity that's in, in that thug's mind that was probably one way of redemption you know I did all this bad I'll just do this little good in his mind he did something good but in the mind of the person that just got robbed is he good? no he's not so to cut to the chase basically when we are saying that we don't need religion in order to be a good person, the first question we want to ask is, who am I going to be good according to then? Because every single person here has their own opinion about good. And that's just in this small crowd here, let alone the six billion people which are on the face of this planet right now. And we all know for a fact, that no matter how hard I try, I can never please people 101%. We all know that for a fact. And I'm just going to digress here. I mean, just to get a, get a thorough understanding of this, you have individuals 
who live to put a smile on people's faces. They're called entertainers. Okay, whether they're from Hollywood, Bollywood, or whatever wood they're from. Okay, they live to put a smile on people's faces and get paid for it at the same time. They will dress a certain way. They will walk a certain way. They will talk a certain way. They live to impress. But you and I know, for a fact, that are they impressing every single person on the face of this planet? Yes or no? No. Proof of that, when we go to Shoppers Drug Mart or we go to uh, Food Basics or whatever store we're at and we're at the cashier, what do you see there? You see a whole bunch of tabloids and magazines, right? And what are they all doing? Instead of praising that person who's living to impress, they're bad-mouthing that person, revealing their secrets, trying to show the deficiencies in their ways and making money off it. So were they, those people, those entertainers, were they successful in pleasing all of society? Yes or no? No, they weren't. So coming down to this, when it comes to this concept of good, we want to ask ourselves, what standard do I need to adhere to? Well, we first and foremost need to identify which part of society do I want to be part of? Do I want to be part of the, the gangsta culture? Do I want to be part of the gothic culture? Do I want to be part of the hip-hop culture? Or do I want to be part of the Muslim culture? I need to identify that first. Which group do I want to associate myself to? If I want to associate myself with the gangsta culture, then I need to walk with a limp. I have to have a gun. I've got to push drugs. And then I will be good in their eyes. Okay. So basically there's a standard that has to be adhered to. There's a standard. If I don't follow that standard, I'm not going to be good in those people's eyes. So this is the first question I want to ask myself. Which people do I want to associate myself with? And this is something we do subconsciously, but we really need to become more and more conscious of this because right now, the vast majority of us, especially when we hit high school, we're facing an identity crisis. And now we're trying to come up with this new identity, which today we will like to call Canadian Muslim. And the interpretation of Canadian Muslim, it varies from circle to circle. Okay, and we all know that. So we are genuinely facing an identity crisis. So I need to first and foremost answer this question, who do I want to associate myself with? Which group do I want to be part of? And while I'm trying to make that decision, I need to ask another question. That out of all these groups, which group is going to benefit me in the long term? And when I say long term, we're not talking 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. We're talking in the time when we leave this world, we're laid to rest, and then we're facing the stages which are gonna come our way. I need to ask myself, that out of all of these groups, which group, which methodology, which standard is going to be the most beneficial to me? Then after answering this question, I will look for the group that will serve me I mean, this benefit the most and associate myself to them. And when it comes to answering these questions, if we don't want to answer it ourselves, we'll collectively answer it. And the answer is that if there is any standard that we want to adopt and adhere to in order to reap long-term benefits, benefits which are not limited to this transitory world, but benefits which will continue for eternity, I need to adopt the standard that my Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which he had demonstrated, which he had taught and which he had imparted. And the group 
that had adopted those teachings wholeheartedly, unconditionally, they were known as Muslims. They are people who are submitters. People who had unconditionally adopted those standards. One is to be labeled a Muslim and one is to actually be a Muslim in essence, where a person has unconditionally submitted themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked in the Quran or told us in the Quran, Udu fi silmi kafa. Enter into Islam completely, not partially, not 20%, 30%, or 40%, not even 99%, 100%. Once I've identified the standard, now I need to find the people who have embraced the standard. And Alhamdulillah, this is the right place to find them. The people who associate themselves to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who serve the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who make sacrifices for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who truly have submitted themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, what we need to understand is that coming and answering that question, do I need to be religious in order to be good? The answer is, if I want to be good in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the answer is yes. I do need to be religious. And I need to adopt Islam. But we're going to ask, why? Why just Islam? Because it's a question that's always asked. Why just Islam? I mean, God is supposed to be merciful. God is supposed to be loving. There's Christians which are doing good people. I mean, that are doing good things. There are Jewish people that are doing good things. There are Hindu people that are doing good things. Why is it that only Muslims are going to go to paradise? Why is it that... Paradise is only reserved for this group. This is a question many people ask. And we want to first and foremost understand that when it comes to that benefit that we were alluding to earlier on, that benefit is going to manifest in the hereafter in the form of Jannah. That is going to be the paycheck for the people who had submitted themselves unconditionally to Allah and who had worked hard to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their reward is going to be in proportion to the efforts they had made. It will come in the form of Jannatul Firdaus, inshallah. It will come in the form of Jannah. And where a person is going to be accommodated in Jannah is all dependent on how well he performed in this life. So that is that long-term benefit where a person is going to go and basically do whatever he wants to do. Basically ask for whatever he wants to ask for and get it without compromise. For you is going to be whatever your heart desires and whatever you ask for. So that place that we are talking about that is the benefit long-term benefit eternal benefit I need to first identify who does that place belong to maybe you can tell me who does Jannah belong to I can't hear you a bit louder is there a disagreement on this does anyone disagree Jannah belongs to who it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is his sole real estate. Okay, he is the whole and sole owner of Jannah. Now when he owns Jannah, and he's associated to, associated to himself, I mean in Surah Al-Fajr, what do we read? فَدْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي وَدْخُلِي جَنَّتِي Okay, enter within my servants and enter within my paradise. So Jannah belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when a person owns some real estate, when a person owns a house, and he sets some rules, does anyone outside the house have the right to object to those rules? You tell me. You have your own house. You may have set a rule, no shoes in this house. If you want to come in this house and you want to walk around, take your shoes off by the door. No smoking in this house. If you want to smoke, kindly go outside. 
No TV in this house. You want to watch anything from the tube? Please go elsewhere. These are the rules you have set in your house. And I come in. Do I have any right to disrespect those rules? Yes or no? It's your house. It belongs to you. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you. Hence, you are the person that has the full authority to decide what the rules of this place is going to be. Now when it comes to Jannah, we just agreed it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And it's so totally up to him what rules he wants to set in order to admit and accommodate people into that place. It's not up to me. It's not up to any person on the face of this planet. It is solely up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he has already now decided a criterion that if you want to come in this real estate, there are some rules that you have to adhere to. You first need to come with a ticket of paradise. Just like if I want to go and watch a game at the Rogers Center, or I want to go and watch a game at the ACC, can I just walk in? Yes or no? You tell me. I can't just walk in and just seat myself comfortably by the court or the rink or the diamond. What do I need in order to get in? I need a, I need a ticket. Once I've gotten in with a ticket, depending on how much I paid for that ticket, I will be accommodated, right? I mean, I can pay premium price and get rink side or court side or diamond side uh, seats. Or I can pay minimal price and get a space all the way near the rafters where everyone that's playing only look like little specks and ants. It's up to me how much I pay. Jannah is no different. Keep that in mind. But when it comes to Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's real estate, He wants a ticket from us and He also wants cash from us. When I say cash, I'm not talking about dollars and cents. I'm not talking about the debit cards, credit cards, and the plastic that we carry in our pocket. pocket. I'm talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's currency. And we just heard it right now in Salah when our Imam was reciting. That if you want admittance into this place, bring the ticket, and that ticket is Iman, that ticket is La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. That's the ticket. Once you got the ticket, now let's see how much cash you've got. And that's where our deeds are going to be weighed and that, that is the legal tender of the hereafter. That is what counts in the hereafter. The good that we did according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standard. And based on how much I present, I will be accommodated. If I work day and night, I worked hard, I tried my best, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to compensate me for all the good that I've done that is dedicated to Him and devoted to Him. Insha'Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate us more than we can ever dream of. Keep in mind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He comes to compensating people, He never shortchanges anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he never rips people off. Keep that in mind. He's always giving people bonuses even though they do not deserve bonuses. Right now, we just did one action. We prayed collectively. Okay, we just did four rakat and then some people did their sunnah and witr right now, some people are going to do it later. But in essence, it was only one action. But because we made the effort to come into the masjid, because we made the effort to stand behind the Imam for approximately 10 minutes and listen to his qira'ah, because we made the effort to come here and stand shoulder to shoulder, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now going to compensate us as if we did this one action 27 times. And 
going forward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean, He doesn't have any bounds and limitations and restrictions. He can compensate as much as He wants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate people in full when it comes to the patient people. He'll compensate them without any account, without any restrictions and limitations. When a person just brings one good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is compensating it at the bare minimum by ten times. Man ja'a bil hasana falahu ashru amthaliha. Whoever brings a good deed, and for him is the equivalent of ten. So bottom line, it depends on how much effort we make that our final accommodation will be determined in Jannah insha'Allah. And think about this. Look how appreciative Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. He calls himself shak. Excuse me. He calls himself Shakir. Okay, he's appreciative. He says, Wakana sa'yukum mashkura. That your efforts are appreciated. How much does he appreciate our efforts? Think about this. We find in a hadith, according to Sahih Bukhari, and some versions, you also find this in Sahih Muslim as well. One version dictates that a man, he went down a well. And I'm sure we've all heard this story. A man went down a well, quenched his thirst, came back out only to see a dog panting, and realized that this dog, not human, okay, a dog, is now, is right now currently experiencing what he had just experienced. And hence he makes the effort to go back down the well, fill his socks up with water, come back out, and quench the thirst of this dog. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so appreciative of this, appreciative of this, that He granted him Jannah just because of this. Just for giving a dog some water. A person realized that on the, on the public pathway, there is this little branch that is sticking out and it's causing hindrance to people and he made a commitment that I'm going to go and chop that branch away or it was more of one of those roots that come out of those old trees and we've, we must have seen them when trees age and then you have the roots they start coming up to the surface of the ground someone can trip over that and hurt themselves so this individual according to a hadith in Sahih Muslim goes and chops that away so it's not of hindrance to people anymore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this little action appreciated it so much that he grants him Jannah so think about it small little actions are going to grant I mean it's going to earn a person Jannah imagine a person who has committed his entire life to serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is Allah going to give him so now coming back to what we originally wanted to discuss and I don't want to go over my time because alhamdulillah we have big guests here that deserve more time to share their impart their knowledge inshallah um, so I was saying coming back to the original point remember one thing that when it comes to the question that do I have to be religious in order to be good the answer is for me as a Muslim yes for a person that wants eternal bliss yes for a person that wants everlasting benefits yes for a person that doesn't want any share of that stuff then no they don't need to be religious okay a person if they don't want to adhere to these standards then we have a billion and one standards which are out there and every standard varies and its interpretation also varies so we as Muslims are people who are far-sighted keep this in mind one of the sicknesses that we have in society is that we live the moment my dear respected brothers and sisters, my humble request to all of us is please get away from that philosophy. Get away from that mindset. We are not people who just live the moment. We are people who are living for the future. And where every, every single action of ours is carefully calculated. And the calculation is all about, is this going to make me move forward or is this going to make me move backwards? And when we're talking about moving forward and backwards, 
based on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's standards. So yes, it is important to be religious. It is important for an individual to embrace the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now keep this in mind. Now that I've made this decision that yes, I want to be a good person according to Allah's standards, I want to, I want to be eligible to enter into that place where I will be able to enjoy myself for the rest of eternity. I don't have to fast, I don't have to pray, I just have to party and party and party. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. That's all what Jannah is all about because a person worked for it here. But how do I go about accomplishing that now? I've made this decision. Yes, I want that. I've made a commitment. Yes, I want to listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how do I go about doing this? See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that He didn't leave the jigsaw puzzle of life for us to figure out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that He sent us a guide and He also sent us a manual. That manual is known as the Qur'an. And that guide, that instructor is known as Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi lillati hiya aqwam. This Qur'an is going to guide us to the most upright route and up, upright way. And it's hudan linnas, it's guidance for all of humanity. And only those people are going to really benefit from this guidance who are conscious of Allah. And that's why Allah says, Hudallil Muttaqeen. So we have this book of guidelines. Now, how do I go about approaching these guidelines? And I really want to emphasize this because this is really important. Keep this in mind that the scripture that we have in our hands, Wallahi al Azim, Wallahi al Azim, Wallahi al Azim, it's the most powerful scripture on the face of this planet. There is nothing that supersedes it in any shape or form. And this is really the acknowledgement as well of people who formerly used to be atheists, who formerly used to be anti religious, and when they got exposure to this book subhanallah their life had just turned 180 degrees we do not realize the power the magnitude of this book my dear respected brothers and sisters please do not reduce this book to a book of blessings that's only pulled out when someone passes away in the family or when we make a new acquisition Please, for the sake of Allah, do not reduce this book to that much because it's much more than that. The sad thing is that we as Muslims are not benefiting from this book as much as non-Muslims are. This is a sad reality. We've reduced this book to just a book of blessings. And the best reason, and I'm not saying this for the sake of criticism, I'm saying this for the sake of reforming myself and reforming ourselves. It's not for the sake of criticism. It's just to bring a reality in front of us so that we can deal with it. So this book that we have, the scripture that we have, is, it is extremely powerful. Think about it, think about it. A guy who is about to go and assassinate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, changes his life because he's had exposure to just a few verses of Surah Taha and now he's reached a position where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying لَوْ كَانَ نَبِيًا بَعْدِي لَكَانَ عُمَرًا Think about the transformation that came into that person's life. One minute he was an attempted assassin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He wanted to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and now he has become so devout that he's become one of the most powerful leaders in human history and he reached a position that had, there, had the doors of prophethood been opened after Rasulullah that is the man that would have got it. Umar radiallahu Think of the transformation. Think of the power that this book had and has and will have for the rest of eternity. It is extremely powerful. And in order for us to understand these guidelines, because this is what the Qur'an is, it's a book of guidelines. And the reason I'm going down this route is so we understand now where the standard of good is found. Okay? 
The standard of good is found in this scripture. And how do we go about approaching it? Now that I've identified this as a book of guidelines, which is essential for my spiritual welfare and for long-term benefit, how do I go about approaching this? Well, there's a variety of ways of approaching it nowadays. One is I can approach it myself. I can pick up an English translation. I will read a few verses. I will come up with my own interpretation. And I, in my mind, will be guided. That is one approach. Another approach is that a person, he endeavors hard to go about understanding the implications of, this, of these verses by turning to those people who have committed their lives to understanding what this book is all about, known as the ulama, known as the scholars, who have devoted their lives to trying to collect all the prophetic traditions related to those verses. Everything that has been related from the successors, such as the Sahaba and the Tabi'een. And in light of that, they go about interpreting this book. The correct interpretation or the correct approach is the latter one, not the former one. Although the former one has now gained popularity. And right now we're living in a time where people, na'udhu billahi min thalik, are category, categorically rejecting the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Categorically. And it's becoming a widespread problem. And they're saying that you must approach the Qur'an with an unpolluted mind. And the pollution that they're alluding to, na'udhu billah, are the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is a reality. We don't have to make this up. It's going on here in the very city that we're sitting in. And if we were to actually approach the Qur'an, we'd find that that notion is totally contradictory to what the Qur'an is telling us because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in that very Qur'an that He has revealed this scripture upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So that you can explain to the people what has been revealed upon them and hence they could contemplate, they can, they can basically reflect And the Prophet Wasallam's mandate was to come and to teach people the book and words of wisdom and the teachings of wisdom So hence, in order for me to understand how to go about incorporating this standard which is found in the most powerful scripture on the face of this planet I need to understand it in the light of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa teachings because according to Allah he is the primary exegete of this book he is the primary mufassir of this book he is the primary explainer of this book Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not come for 23 years from the age of 40 to 63 just to teach us five times daily salah and recite the Qur'an on certain occasions. Think about it, he could have done that on a weekend course. Double weekend course. Okay? 23 years, what did he demonstrate? 23 years, he showed us what that standard of good is. From the time we wake up until the time we go to sleep, how do we live a life which is good according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's standard? That's what that life is all about. And if we make the effort to go and adopt that lifestyle, we will not only just be good in the eyes of Allah, we will be excellent in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To try and bring this to a closure and stay within the time, if we really want to know how good we are in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's very easy. You do not have to go far. You do not have to do extensive research. You don't have to ask for the power of kash that Allah opens this up to you. It's, it's very easy. All we need to do is compare our lifestyle to the lifestyle of Rasulullah It's as easy as that. And see whether it's confluent or contradictory. If it's confluent, Alhamdulillah, 
I'm, clo I'm really close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when I analyze, I compare my life to the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I can see a total match. But if we do not find absolute confluency, but we're finding a lot of contradic contradictory traits in us. I mean, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did things this way, and I'm doing it that way. Keep this in mind, the more contradictions there are in our lives with the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the further we are away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the less we are following the standard of good in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So hence, we need to all make a commitment, all of us, from this day onwards, and do not be shy of this. Let's all make a commitment that from this day onwards, we are going to learn the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are going to adopt the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And inshallah, we are all, male and female, are going to be the ambassadors of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can we all make this commitment? My dear respected brothers and sisters, do not be afraid. There's nothing to fear. People are literally thirsty out there right now for an alternative way of life. For us, the grass is always greener on the other side. It looks green. But in reality, it's not that green because when you get there, it's dried hay. It's just a mirage with no water there at all. That's the reality. So do not become deluded and do not become deceived because that is what shaitan is doing I will definitely beautify sin and I will basically lead them all off the track and he's made it very clear to Allah you're not going to find the vast majority of them to be grateful so do not become deceived do not be afraid. Do not develop an inferiority, inferior, inferiority complex right, about what we have. Be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has given us Islam. Do not go out there and reduce your name from Bilal to Bil, Muhammad to Mo, Zakaria to Jack. If we ourselves are not going to respect the teachings that we adhere to, or we claim to adhere to, how can we expect other people to respect it? Think about it. If I do not respect my own clothes, how can I ex expect someone else to respect it? So first, it has to start from us to change. So first and foremost, develop, I mean, eliminate, I should say, an inferiority complex with these teachings. These teachings are the best teachings on the face of this planet. And proof of that, is that the vast majority of us that are sitting here are born in a Muslim home whose forefathers or ancestors had embraced Islam once upon a time because they saw value in this in a teaching that started from an Arabian desert on the other side of the planet in a nation that no one wanted to touch the Byzantines and the Sassanids wanted to have nothing to do with those people but from that piece of land Within a span of 20 years, a huge revolution had started that had changed the face of this world. That today we have 1.6 billion people on the face of this planet that are adhering to those teachings that were imparted 1400 years ago because there's value in it. Respected brothers and sisters, value what Allah has given us. Make sure, understand that this is important. And I will finish off with this, that the only way we're going to be able to value it is when we actually stay in the company of those who value it. Remember, our perceptions and our mindset is really shaped by two things. The things we expose ourselves to and the people we associate ourselves with. If I'm not going to get any exposure, say for example, I never heard of the iPhone. I don't even know what the iPhone is. What's going to make me want to go and line up for three days in front of an Apple store? I don't even know what it is. I've never been exposed to an app. I don't even know how to spell app. How am I going to have any inclination towards it? But as soon as I start reading up on it, 
As soon as I start associating with people who have this phone, as soon as I hear the fawa'il, I hear, hear the virtues of this phone, now I'm ready to make a sacrifice that three days before its release, I'll be in the Eaton Center with a spot reserved, making sure I get the first phone. It's all because of exposure. If I was not exposed to it, I would not have any inclination towards it. So we need to control what we are exposing ourselves to. If we're going to expose ourselves to other standards, Wallahi al we will have more value for that than we have for Islam. And the thing that will help us minimize the exposure and basically solidify our inclination within Islam is to associate with the people that have devoted themselves to Islam. This is the practical way of going about adopting these standards, thus becoming good in the eyes of Allah and reaping long-term eternal benefits for the rest of eternity. That being said, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah gives us the thorough understanding of this religion that He has blessed us with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from the many fitan and trials that are out there it's a very big trial that we're in. Remember, we're living in a society where there's an outright war against God. Okay, trying to eliminate God from society. You believe in God, you're primitive. You don't believe in God, you're progressive. This is the, th the mindset that is out there. But one thing I'll close off with, and this is food for thought. Every person has a God. Even the people who are denying that they have a God, they've got a God. Who is their God? Their God are their desires. That's what they've submitted themselves to. Because what is religion? Religion is a collection of beliefs and practices which are dedicated to an entity or a divinity, a divine being. Islam is a collection of religion, uh, I should say practices and beliefs devoted to Allah. When it comes to people who have kicked God out of themselves, out of their lives, who have they devoted themselves to? They've devoted themselves to themselves. Okay. Have you, will, you not, will you consider those people who have taken up their desires as God? Can you be responsible over them? So keep this in mind. There's no person on the face of this planet that doesn't believe in a God. Everyone has a God. But Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed us with the understanding and the submission to the one and only true God. That is Allah. Wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.